Our guest today is a human resources leader from one of the world's most recognizable brands. Hello, I'm Chester Elton, and this is my co-author, Adrian Gosta. Well, thanks, Chess. Yeah, today we're going to learn how the makers of Heinz ketchup, Kraft mac and cheese, some of our favorites, keep their 37,000 people feeling mentally strong. As always, we hope the time you spend with us will help reduce the stigma of anxiety at work and in your personal life. And with us is our friend Alexandra Highland, head of functional learning and culture and global. <laughs> Let me do that again. And with us is our. our is... I'm speaking Guy Lafleur. Just stop for a minute. There we go. Um, with us is our friend Alexandra Highland, head of functional learning and culture, and global senior director of learning and diversity at the Kraft Heinz Company. Alexandra has a unique background in political science, ethics, and law as well as a master's degree in counseling psychology. At Kraft Heinz, Alexandra leads a global team working to create a culture of learning with competency-focused development that enables and empowers employees to their own learning and to execute with excellence while growing great careers with a great company. Now, Alexandra is joining us from Toronto, Canada, eh? And uh, we have a lot of fun. And by the way, it's not Kraft Mac and Cheese up in Canada. It's just craft dinner. So a little cultural nuance there, but Alexandra, we're delighted to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for finding the time. Well, thank you. It's great to, to be together. And we've already had a laugh, so it's already a, a great day for me. So <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, a lot of people know the name Kraft Heinz, maybe not know all the brands that are associated, but give us just a quick little 30-second information on the business. And then more importantly, help us understand what you're doing to help evolve the Kraft Heinz culture and, and help the people that, you know, within your care to, to learn and grow and thrive? Well, it's, it's such a great question. And I'm so happy to talk about it. I feel like, you know, a lot of us maybe compete for the title of sort of proudest advocate or cheerleader for our brands. Uh, with my parents being up there too, they always send me pictures of our brands when they're traveling, which is so much fun. Um, but, you know, we're the third largest food and beverage company in North America, fifth largest in the world. Um, you know, as you said, iconic and emerging food and beverage brands. We deliver taste, fun, quality to every meal, you know, meal table we touch. What a fun, uh, you know, company to work for. Consumers are at the center of everything we do, you know, from the quality of, uh, you know, our world class iconic brands to our commitment to the communities, you know, where we live and, and work and do business all over the world. Um, and, and what really excites me is that our people are connected by a shared culture of ownership, agility, you know, and endless curiosity. And curiosity is a word I'll, I'll touch on because it's sort of one of my own personal values. Um, it, it's so important to innovation. It's so important to business growth, but it's also the key and an entry point to how we can relate to each other. Um, and, and even mental health, taking sort of a, a, trying to suspend judgment and instead invite curiosity to, to really be that door open to learning about others, learning about ourselves. You know, as a company, we believe just being good humans, you know, who are working to improve the company, our community, our planet. Um, and for me, that that sort of purpose is super, super important and super empowering and, you know, Chester, you kind of mentioned it at the beginning, but my role really uh, from a learning and diversity perspective is to empower learning for, for our teams through what we call our learning value proposition, which is enabling employees to really learn like an owner so that they can execute with excellence in their current role, accelerate that learning curve and grow a great career, whatever that means to them, right? And whatever that means today and, and tomorrow. And that's just... You know, I, I think back to first year psychology and, well, just probably the only thing I remember from first year is my <laughs> my buddy Maslow, right? And that idea right. of, of the hierarchy of needs. And for me, it's such a privilege and a responsibility and an honor to basically get to hang out at the top of the pyramid with Maslow around helping everybody to just be the best version of themselves, whatever that looks like today, whatever that looks like tomorrow, because it might be different. Um, but what a joy, what a privilege. You know, we, we love talking to people that are passionate about, you know, their their callings, uh, which is more than a job. And uh, certainly you've got that in spades. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, you've got such an interesting background, you know, because you've got this master's in counseling. 
And you mentioned that you've got this passion for, for mental health, you know, and curiosity and innovation and helping people be their better selves. But what do business leaders need to do to help with the mental health, you know, at where you are with your team members? Are there certain things you're really focused on? Yeah, I think it's it's a few things. The first thing I'll say, and certainly take no credit for this statement, is in mental health is health. Full stop, right? We don't judge somebody with coronary artery disease and tell them to just try harder or to buck up. We don't tell someone with diabetes to tell their pancreas that tomorrow is going to be a better day, <laughs> right? So then why why do we do that with those experiencing challenges with their mental health, right? And, and I think the reason... It's not nefarious. The reason is rooted in fear, right? We, we're afraid of what we don't know. We're afraid of something that has been sort of painted through time and history as something very scary. And consequently, we, we try to keep it at a 10-foot pole, right? You know, there's such a stigma. And I think that stigma just comes from the unknown, from this primal fear of what if it could happen to me? Right. If I don't talk about it, if I don't engage it, if I push it away, it's not going to touch me. But as leaders, you know, that we can bury our head in the sand, but I, I can tell you how that's going to go because mental health is is everywhere. Good mental health, poor mental health and everything in between. And, you know, I, I mentioned before curiosity. I think we can combat the fear by embracing curiosity. We can reduce judgment by embracing curiosity our own that of our own health of our colleagues right and and if we can do that we can grow from a place of empathy you know whether it's colleagues neighbors friends we can empathize with lived experiences differently and chances are like we will relate on levels that we didn't know but we have to be willing to sort of address the fear but again i think we address the fear through curiosity um and i think that leaders really have a role to play maybe more so than anybody else in the organization in mm -hmm. creating the conditions under which people can show up as their best mm -hmm. selves, um, embrace the good, the bad, and everything in between, and acknowledge that, you know, our, our health, physical and mental shows up at work, whether we want it to or not. So again, we can bury our head or we can embrace that and say, okay, what can I do as a leader to create the best conditions under which you can live your most, most healthy and authentic self? Yeah, it's a, it's a shame. We just I just saw a comment too from some somebody posted to one of our things who said uh, and there's a leader who said uh, yeah talking about anxiety just creates more anxiety and it's like oh I thought <laughs> I thought we were past those uh, kind of Neanderthal kind of uh, things but no there's still people out there who believe that so it's a constant process like you say mental health is health you got to talk about it you can't hide it. That's right. And, and I think, too, you know, again, this idea of if we don't talk about it, it's not happening. Yeah. Well, you know, I, there's this idea of presenteeism, right? I might physically be at work, but am I able to give it my, my best every day? No. You know, if you have a cold, if you have the flu, you're not able to give your best. So you give yeah. your body a rest. I think we have to acknowledge that if we don't talk about it, if we don't address it, people may physically be at work, but they're not doing their best work. How could yeah. they? So how can we just kind of call that elephant into the room, name it and say, OK, what can we do to create the conditions under which we can return somebody to feeling their best self as quickly as possible? And I want uh, people making my mac and cheese to be at their best. So I'm so <laughs> glad you're doing this. Yeah. Hey, one thing you've mentioned a few times already today is is purpose uh, cool. in our work. And, you know, leaders look, we need to inspire purpose. So help us understand a little bit of how people find purpose in their work and how you do that at Kraft Heinz and, um, and what leaders listening today can do to help with that. Because, you know, sometimes we're making, you know, I'm running a rubber chicken factory. Well, is there really purpose in that? I'm, you know, help me understand how I create purpose when, when sometimes that may be a little struggle. Yeah. I think, you know, I look at my own career and certainly, you know, starting as an undergrad, I, I thought I was going down the lawyer track. That was going to be a clear purpose, you know. Sorry, mom and dad, that didn't, you know, pan out. Then I, I saw, you know, a career in mental health and that was going to be my clear purpose, you know. And through going through that, it didn't diminish my desire to be involved in mental health, but I realized very quickly that I'm an empath. Not empathetic. I, I mean, I am empathetic, but I'm an empath in that I viscerally feel what other people feel. 
that does not make for a great sort of temperament for doing counseling all day, right? But what do you do at that point? You know, you've got an undergrad, you've got a, a master's degree, you know, and you're looking and thinking, well, what is my purpose? And in retrospect, I can tell a wonderful story about how this was all intentional and it all fits together in some beautiful scheme. But if I'm honest, that's not how it came together. And so when I think about how did I discover my purpose, it's really in that intersection of what you're good at, what the world needs, and what you care about. And, you know, maybe a little bit what helps you make a living because, you know, that's important too. But I discovered that by actually going down various channels and picking up what I could that I loved and where I felt that I could be of service and thinking about, well, is there a world where I can put all these things together? Where can I show up and care about mental health, care about learning, take this curiosity that I have and, and try to inspire others? You know, there's a degree of, of policy and law and ethics in what I do, but I think it's about do I literally live my purpose every single day, to your point? Ah, you know, maybe on a Monday it might feel a little hard, you know. But I think at the end of the day, it's we walk in our purpose either unintentionally or intentionally, right? And I think to truly be purposeful, it needs to be intentional. Um, and, and what I kind of determined was I walk through life very much practicing I'm practicing my purpose in that it's evolving and it's changing. And I'm trying to give myself grace to say that, you know, at the end of my career, I may have three or four more twists and turns, but I feel like I'm walking in my purpose when I'm practicing optimism. Uh, and I say practicing because it doesn't always come, you know, brilliantly to me. Being permanently curious. And again, one of my favorite Walt Whitman quotes or Ted Lasso, whoever you want to give credit to, said, you know, be curious, not judgmental. And so I walk in my purpose by trying to live that. And some days I do it well, and some days I don't. But I always come back to this idea that curiosity can be the gateway to so much. I try to be funny. Um, ask my eight-year-old, maybe not so much. But I try to help her see that when things go sideways, things don't go the way we expect, we run into challenge. Can we find a moment of, of levity? Even in the darkest moments, is there a moment of levity? And lastly, being what I call emp epically empathetic. Just, you know, it goes part and parcel with that curiosity. Sometimes it's my kryptonite, but I'm working on leveraging my empathy to truly be my superpower. Um, and I think when leaders are invited to reflect, think about that journey, don't judge the journey, just reflect on it there naturally starts to be this place, that intersection of what you're good at, what the world needs, what you love doing, and it starts to become clear. And it becomes less about a specific role or title and more about the experience that you live every day, how you feel while you're doing it. And I think that's really what, what counts. But that's not what we teach in school. We teach you got to achieve a level and a title. But it, I, I personally think that purpose comes from that innate sense of how you feel about what you're doing and what you're contributing to the world. That is so great. Yeah, yeah. Um, be curious, not judgmental. Um, let's... We wrote a book called uh, Leading with Gratitude and we have a whole chapter on you know, uh, assume positive intent, but you talk about creating positive intent. It's a little different. Explain it to us. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's so easy to get in our own heads about why something happened the way it did, why somebody did something, you know, you should hear the voices that I sometimes read my emails in. I have quite a cast of characters that show up in my mind when I'm reading certain emails. And that cast of characters is often, you know, related to how hungry I am, how tired I am, how, you know, how much rest did I get over the weekend? Um, and so I really am trying to engage in a deliberate practice of interrupting that thought pattern and sort of saying to myself, you know, you've assigned a tone, uh, an intention to this message, but you, you did not create this message. So that may not be correct, and it may not lead to the right sort of reaction or response, et cetera. And one of the most enlightening sort of 
tools that I learned to do this comes from, uh, a, a, I think, a friend of yours, a friend of, of Kraft Heinz, Kasia uh, Urich, and she talks about asking what, not why. And that has been such an incredible unlock for me in, in assuming positive intent. And when I say creating positive intent, it means bringing others along in that journey, that when we catch ourselves going down that why, why, why road, it can be really self-limiting. It can kind of take us down some dark paths. But when we flip that and ask, well, what might have been the conditions that led to that outcome? What might have been the stressors that that person was under? What is it that they are trying to accomplish? It opens up this entirely different world of possibility. It guides our natural sort of narrative to a much more positive place. Um, and when I pair that with, uh, you know, another uh, another friend, Whitney Johnson, she said something to me not long ago where she said, well, what if even 10% of what that person just said was true, right? Or, or, or right. And when you start to just kind of lean into this idea that like, we're all just showing up trying to do our best. If we ask what, not why, what we then do is lock arms together against a challenge versus us against each other. Right. And, and so is it easily done? No way. But I will, when I think about creating this positive intent, it's, it's about holding ourselves accountable that if we see going, you know, a member of the team going down that road, we gently redirect and say, hey, what if 10% of this is true? Or what can we look at in terms of how we got here instead of why? Um, and it's, it's a process, but I find it's a happier way to live anyways, a, a lot more positive. Love that. I love that. Yeah, you're quoting some of our friends from the I know. Uh, Marshall <laughs> Goldsmith 100 I group. I had to name drop a little, yeah. right? I, I got to be in good company. You know how to win friends and influence people. I love that. Hey, how do people <laughs> connect with you then, uh, Alexandra? Where would you send them to yeah. learn more about you and also about Kraft Heinz? Yeah, I mean, our website, craftheinzcompany.com. Follow us on our socials. Something that I'm super proud about is how our brands are showing up on our in, in you know the the social media space responding in real time to culture it's so exciting it's such an exciting time to to be um you know associated with the brand and reach out to me i'm i'm on i'm on the linkedin you know i'm on the, <laughs> i'm on the web uh i'm happy to, to connect with, i mean that's how you know i'm old right that seems, to be catching, um, that seems to be catching on that World Wide Web. Yeah. I, so. I heard the thing. <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 maybe one day I'll check it out. Um, but <laughs> happy for anyone to reach out on, on LinkedIn, and I'm, I'm certainly happy to connect. That's awesome. So tell us, okay, but we've got uh, yeah, maybe three or four minutes left here. Give us some ideas of, you know, our, re our listeners can, can think what Kraft Heinz is doing to help with wellness. Give us some things that you've tried, maybe some things that didn't work, but give us some initiatives that you've found really are successful in helping with the mental health of your people. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I think the first thing really relates to your work, which is that we're talking about it first and foremost, right? There will be things that we try and interventions that land that don't land, but the most important thing that we're doing is we're bringing the conversation to the table. We're having sessions with leaders. We're talking as openly as we can uh, to really help bring light to the topic and reduce stigma. Um, I'm very proud of a program across the organization called Live Well, which is really about supporting and inspiring a culture of well-being uh, for our employees to make healthy life choices inside and outside of work, whether that's physical health, emotional health, financial health, because that's a huge stressor, you know, and social health. Uh, we live in a very multidimensional uh, world. Our health is multidimensional. How can we kind of, you know, again, call that to light? And one more thing that I'm just beyond proud of and, and I'm a member of is we have a mental health first aider program. So just like you train folks to, to respond to a physical first aid emergency, they're not doctors, they're not going to operate, you know, but they can package you up, they can bundle you up and get you where you need to go to, to receive care. We have the same thing for mental health. It's a, a program of employees uh, who volunteer, who are trained to provide that very much sort of in the moment support. Uh, help direct uh, folks to the right resources for that sort of expert level of care. But it helps make our company feel smaller. It helps us feel connected. It humanizes the conversation um, and really allows us to operate with with empathy and care. And, and the program is growing 
Uh, and even just knowing that we have it, whether or not somebody were to take advantage of it, I think just knowing that it's there is just a hugely positive thing. And I'm so, so proud of everyone that's involved in that. Yeah, that really is a wonderful program. You know, we, we talk about it all the time. To your point, even if you don't use it, it's nice to know somebody's cheering for you. You know, that's right. the, the, you've got that safety net. So tell us some of the creative things you're doing around learning initiatives. You talk about curiosity a lot. So what are some of those learning initiatives across Kraft Heinz that other leaders might learn from? Yeah, well, we don't have enough time for that. I mean, I'll go all day, every day. Um, but it really, again, it comes back to this learning value proposition. Um, you know, we really want to create a culture, a culture of learning and creativity. You know, learning is not a one-off. It's not a check-the-box exercise. It's something that we want all of our employees to be engaging in all the time. We try to democratize learning, meaning that no matter where you are, what function you're in, you have access to great quality content that you can learn like an owner and consume. But then, of course, we also have all kinds of other programs, you know, for, for a variety of cohorts and loan on needs, et cetera. We're trying to be creative about our assets. So, you know, a year ago or so, we brought in a TikToker to do learning, and that was, the you know, wildly successful and fun. We partner with, you know, the best of the best from academia. And we always try to create learning opportunities that give people the skill, you know, the, the knowledge, but then the practice. Let's try it out. Let's put the words in our mouths. Let's test the, the new skill that we picked up. Let's fail and pick ourselves up in a supportive environment. And let's build our network while we're doing it, right? How do we make this world feel smaller? It's by building connection. That, of course, helps with mental health as well. So we really try to think about how we can connect folks so that they can be cheerleaders for each other as well. Oh, this has been, yeah, this has been so great. Um, you know, what an amazing organization. I, I'm actually helping uh, ghostwrite a book right now for Mark Thompson and, and uh, Marshall Goldsmith on CEO succession. And one of the, the CEOs we've interviewed is Carlos yes. uh, Abrams Rivera, your, your amazing new CEO, who's such a humble uh, amazing. Just amazing, man. Yeah. yeah. So what a great organization, great people. You can just tell, tell the passion that you have, Alexandra. Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm so privileged. I'm so privileged. So we're always interested, too, in the, in the tactics of people who are as busy and successful as you. How do you keep your mental health strong? And, and what personal tactics do you use that, that help you thrive every day? It's a tough question because I want to give you some beautiful answer that, you know, <laughs> listeners can take away and say, OK, this is the recipe for success. Um, I don't have one. I am learning every day. I am like everyone else, probably. And I cycle through routines and periods of great focus on this. And then it falls by the wayside. But I think the biggest thing that I do is just try to give myself grace to keep showing up and keep finding ways to focus. And when I realize I've deviated from, you know, the, the necessary attention on myself or my family, I bring it back to consciousness and I, I go back at it. And uh, I think for me, I, I find it hard sometimes to hear from leaders that seem to have a whole routine and it's brilliant and it's perfect. And I think, wow, I'm, I'm really failing if I don't have that. So I hope that I can offer the idea that it can be a journey and it can be good sometimes and not great sometimes but at the end of the day i show up and keep trying and i know it's important and um i'll give myself the grace to to keep figuring out what works for me and what works for me changes that's great that's great advice and it is it's an evolution sometimes the, the stuff you do works sometimes it doesn't and you change your, you change your routine which is okay hey give us the one big takeaway if there's one thing you want people to remember from the conversation today other than eventually the Montreal Canadiens will win the Stanley Cup again. <laughs> uh, what, what might it be? Mental health is health. And it's scary. And it is, uh, you know, something that, that we can't escape. But it need not be scary when we approach it with curiosity, when we approach it with empathy, and we listen and learn together. That's the bottom line. There's no one right answer. There's no one solution. But give each other grace and space to explore together. And we can reduce that judgment. We can reduce that fear. And we can then focus on creating a world where we all feel our best as, you know, as much as humanly possible. Well said. Mental health is health. Hey, our guest has been Alexandra Island. She's with Kraft Heinz. You've got products all over your house that they make and enjoy. 
it has been such a delight to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you Alexandra. so much. Thanks. So we are delighted to welcome to the podcast our sponsor, Magic Mind. Now, Magic Mind is this great product, and I use it all the time. I'm telling you, it's all natural. They grow all their mushrooms, all their content, all their ingredients are all natural. You might think, oh, this is like a five-hour energy. It's not. It's an easy up. It's an easy down. It really does calm your mind. I find that Monday mornings for me in particular, Magic Mind is what I use. And for our listeners, we've got a special offer. You'll see it in the show notes where you go to Magic Mind and the little coupon is Gostick and Elton 20. So take advantage of the discounts. Use Magic Mind. I am a huge fan and we are delighted to have them as a sponsor of Anxiety at Work podcast. So the passion, the curiosity, the devotion, I mean, Alexandra was just phenomenal. You can tell that she's thriving in a culture where people really matter. Um, Tell me what uh, some of your big takeaways were. Okay, here's the first takeaway is that uh, I had a chance to interview their CEO, and I bought some stock after just interviewing him because he was such an amazing guy. (laughs) And after listening to, uh, to Alexandra, who immediately quoted their values, ownership, agility, shared curiosity. It's like, you know how many organizations that you and I go into and we ask people, okay, tell us your values. And they go, uh, yeah, they're up on the wall somewhere. There's a poster. I don't remember them right now, but I know there's six, uh, you know, right, I mean, right. boom, you know, that's a culture where everybody is connected by what they believe in. And so that was, that was first, that was the first aha. The second is mental health is health and they're not afraid to talk about it. They're not afraid to embrace the the discussion. That was powerful. Yeah. Yeah. My first takeaway as well, you know, it said, <laughs> the way she put it in context. So what a great sense of humor. He says, you don't tell your pa- pancreas, cheer up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow will be a better day. <laughs> yeah. You know, just uh, buck up friend. Um, the idea of uh, be curious, not judgmental. I thought was was great and, yeah. and creating this positive intent yeah. that we're all in a journey and we're going to learn and we're going to make mistakes and and that's okay, uh, right? The the practicality of what they're implementing too this first aider program on mental health yeah wow what a great um, idea for any company right that you've got mental health uh, well you've got people that work for your company that are trained to be you know, supportive in, in the mental health area. And, and, and she said, and even if you don't use it, you know, it's there. And isn't that a great message that even if you yeah. don't need it, it's, it's like insurance, right? Yeah. I don't think about it a lot, but something terrible happens. It's, it's there. And I know they've got my back. It's so powerful to know that yeah, you have a first responder on staff who can say, okay, I've been there. This is the way we're going to process this. And it's confidential. It's I am your advocate. I'm your support. So powerful. Love that. Um, Yeah. A couple of more things. Uh, You know, she talked a lot about purpose, how important that is in their organization, but also for herself. That look, she says, I try to practice my purpose and we try to figure out what am I good at? What does the world need? And what can I make money at? Um, And that you walk your purpose every day. You want to bring your anxiety down. Find something that you that gives you purpose. For her, it's being you know, as she quoted Walt Whitman, "Be curious, not judgmental." Um, really powerful that that you and I work in every day. To to the people we're coaching, we try to f- have them first and foremost figure out what their purpose is. It's amazing how few people do that. Yeah, yeah. The biggest thing for me was curiosity. Mm-hmm. You know, that that solves a lot of problems. If you yeah. have a culture of curiosity, it, it spurs innovation, it spurs conversation, it's inclusive, you know, and that's why they've got so much learning going on. They, they have a platform that, you, you know, she talked about, it's available to everybody everywhere. Follow your passion, follow your curiosity, and and things get better. So, yeah. And then lastly, I love that she didn't have a formula. So, so many of our yeah. guests do. You know, move, meditate, journal, or, you know, mm-hmm. exercise, or whatever it might be. And she said, you know, I wish I had a great answer for you. I don't. Yeah, but um, what did she say? I give myself grace. That was yes. her formula. So so yeah. it's it's a little different than we hear, but how powerful. Yeah, just uh, 
uh, so many great takeaways and and so many great products. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Buy some stock in Heinz uh, in Kraft Heinz. Like they did, they, 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 you'll probably be in good stead. People have to eat. That is the, that that'll yeah. never change. Yeah. You know, um, we we have so many great guests, and uh, the reason we get to do what we do is because we have a great producer, uh, Brent Klein, who puts together all the mishigash that we've got. There's a little bit of uh, Yiddish for you, um, and and makes it sound great, and and puts it together in a way that people can get great ideas and so on. So we can't thank Brent enough. Well, would you would you say he's like the Kraft Heinz of uh, of producers? That kind of quality. Uh, He's the mac and cheese. He's yeah. the mac and cheese. Yeah. He's, yeah. Yes. <laughs> He's the bedrock. Anyway, and of course, we want to thank Christy uh, Lawrence as well, who finds these amazing guests for us. And of course, all of you who listen in, you can spend your time in a lot of places. And we're delighted that you spent some time with us. If you like the podcast, share it with friends and family. Uh, we'd love you to visit our website, thecultureworks.com, for some free resources to help you and your team not just you know get through the day, but to thrive. And what we love to do more than even eating uh, Kraft Heinz products is uh, <laughs> speaking to audiences around the world, virtually or in person. We love to speak on culture, teamwork, resilience. I just landed last night at late in the evening, uh, but we were, I was so excited to come uh, speak to Alexandra. But uh, that's what we do. Give us a call. We'd love to have you uh, and chat maybe about your event and how we can make that great. Right, Chess? Yeah, and of course, buy the book, Anxiety at Work. It's available uh, in hardcover, in, in uh, digital, audible, and a wonderful new platform called Lit Video Books. We also have some wonderful online training we've just launched, so you'll find that at the Culture Works as well on Anxiety at Work. Well, another wonderful podcast, great guests, lots of energy, lots of applause all the way around. But as always, Adrian, I give you the last word. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Until next week, we wish you the best of mental health.